Welcome to episode 10 of the Multinational Money Podcast. Welcome to the Multinational Money Podcast. I'm Johnny, your host, and if you're interested in financial freedom, expat life, and making the most of global opportunities, then this is your podcast. In this episode, I'm joined by Mikhail Sleister. Mikhail is originally from the US, like many other guests, began in the corporate world before moving to remote work and has now built a full-time online business. Mikhail has experienced 34 different countries around the world and is now residing in Spain on a digital nomad visa. So we're gonna talk about her experience in all these different countries, how she built her digital nomad business and why she ended up choosing Spain as her place to be. So I hope you enjoy the episode, guys. Let's get right into it. So, Mikkel, welcome to the Multinational Money Podcast. Hello. Nice to have you on. Uh, I think I found you on the YouTube like recommendations page. I think your content came up. Um, and I think, obviously, as someone living in Spain with a lot of viewers who are interested in Spain as well, um, your digital nomad video is what stood out to me when I, I found you. So I'm looking forward to talking through your journey because you're not just you're obviously in Spain now, but you've covered a whole load of countries as well. Um, and we're going to answer as well why why you chose Spain out of uh, so many countries. So I'm excited to get into this. Cool. Sounds great. So start by telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, maybe your story as well to becoming a digital nomad. Yeah. So basically over the last four years, I traveled 34 countries. Now, I didn't always use to travel about four and a half years ago, I was living in Tampa and I just felt like my life was passing me by. I was working for iHeartMedia, so I had a really cool job. I got to go to cool events, but my favorite part of the day was definitely driving to work and like getting to see the ocean. And one day I just literally woke up and I decided I was going to work online and travel. This is back in 2019 and people thought I was crazy. I was obsessed. I would spend all hours of the day listening to podcasts, messaging random people on Instagram. I would do anything I could to just figure out what people were doing. And essentially after 250 jobs, I finally got an interview and that interview led to me getting a job. So the job was a 90 day contract to hire. And on the 60th day, I decided to fly to Peru. For some reason, I built up in my head, if I could travel to Peru solo, I could travel anywhere. And this actually happened to be in March, 2020. So I'm in Peru, I'm having the time of my life, and I go to the airport and I decide I'm not gonna go to Machu Picchu, I'm actually gonna fly back to the US. And seven hours later, Peru went into lockdown, no one in, no one out. And I was super defeated because I was working for this for like six months, finally got it, and then COVID hit. And at that time, I decided to launch a travel blog, and that blog really took me on a crazy journey. So about two months passed, I joined this group called Wi-Fi Tribe. I'm not sure if you are familiar with it at all. Um, but I joined Wi-Fi Tribe, and someone was hosting a trip in Croatia. And I was messaging her back and forth and was interested, but because of COVID, I had to re-sign my apartment and I actually didn't have the money to like pay for my apartment in Tampa and also travel. And I sent her my blog and she was like, hey, my boss actually likes your writing. We want to offer you this apartment in Croatia in exchange for travel writing. So two weeks later, I fly out to Croatia. I'm surrounded with 40 digital nomads. A few days after that, the lady that liked my writing actually quit the company. And from there, like the next day, someone came up to me and was like, I want to hire you. I'm like, what do you mean hire me? He's like, I want to hire you to work for me. And then it was this huge snowball. I spent two years traveling with that group of like 40 nomads. Now I'm living in Spain, running my own business. And yeah, that's kind of quickly how it happened. What a journey. Wow. Very, very exciting journey. I want to come back to a couple of aspects of your journey as well, because 2019 remote work existed, but not like it exists today. So how was it um, dealing with a lot of the wow, you're crazy kind of thing? Um, because I mean, now if someone says it, it'd be like, OK, cool. 
because I think it's more mainstream. I was saying this on a another episode that I recently did. Like it's it's a bit more mainstream now and a bit more common. Um, but in 2019, it was emerging, but it wasn't kind of to the level it was now. Yeah, I I think the thing was is there was like no one doing it. Like I didn't know anyone or any friends of a friend who were doing it. So it was really hard for me to find people. Um, and I felt really like, I, I felt crazy for thinking I could do it, but I just had this like, no matter what, that it was gonna work out type of mindset. And the worst was definitely what my parents thought. My parents were like, what are you doing with your life? Like you're in Mexico, no one knows where you are, like you're not even working. And my first remote job, I was working for a tech company out of San Francisco. So my resume was picked from thousands and thousands of resumes. And I knew when I got the interview, I was like, I have to land this job, like no matter what, because out of that four months and 250 jobs, I think I had no interviews besides that one because I only had two years experience and I was coming from sales. Okay, yeah. All right, so we'll move on to now We've got basically two kind of sections that we're going to look at with you. One is obviously your travel experience, which I cover with, you know, a lot of the digital nomad guests on the podcast. But a lot of your business now is centered around how to build a digital nomad business, which I've talked about a little bit with other guests, but we're going to talk about it in quite a bit of detail with you, which I'm very, very interested to do and, and very excited to talk about. For someone who is looking to get started on their digital nomad journey, what's the best advice you can give to them uh, to help them get started? I think the biggest thing is believing that you can do it. If you don't think it's possible, then it's not going to happen. I meet so many people and they're like, oh my God, I'm so jealous of your lifestyle. I want to do what you're doing, but I can't. If you have any part of you that thinks that you can't do it, you're not going to be able to. Out of traveling these last four years, I have not met any digital nomad who's magically slipped into this lifestyle. It takes some work. You're gonna have to put some time in. And I also recommend doing like set goals. So in my case, I wanted to get a remote job first. So setting goals around like, okay, how many jobs am I gonna apply for a week? I think mine was like 30 to 50 a week I wanted to apply for a minimum. So really setting that number high and staying consistent with it. And also knowing too that it's really competitive and yes, it has become more mainstream to become a digital nomad, but also it's still like one in 10 jobs are remote. So you are going for like very, very competitive jobs, but believing that you can do it, staying consistent and not giving up, even if it takes a year. Yeah. I saw in one of your videos as well, you talk about manifesting a lot. And I also believe in the power of, you know, if it like believing that I can do it. I understand there's obviously external factors that are sometimes outside of my control, but I always kind of set myself a goal that I know I, that I, know I can achieve, that I believe I can achieve, even if it's difficult. Um, so yeah, I think it's very important, the mindset, like you said. <laughs> Yeah. And tying into that, I do believe a lot in manifesting different things into life, but I also believe in like aligned action. If you're sitting at your house and you're thinking that you're magically going to meet people who work online, who can open doors for you, but you're not going to meetups, you're not messaging people, you're not educating yourself, you're not taking courses, that's not going to happen. Everything that I'm doing now in my business, I did not learn in school. I taught myself after COVID. So everything that I offer, everything that I make money off of, I literally took courses online to learn how to do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There has to be some kind of action on your part as well. And so for people looking for jobs or activities that they can do to get their digital nomad lifestyle or business started, what are the, we'll say some of the best in terms of like the most popular and the highest earning um, jobs or activities that someone can do? So I think it comes down to a few, it comes down to a few different things. First off, if you can work in tech, that's going to obviously be a big one. And by tech, you could be some type of developer or something in that realm. I also think marketing is huge and it allows you to have clients from all different places and not necessarily need to be there. But I've also met people who make really good money as digital nomads and they are coaches as well. So like it really comes down to figuring out what it's going to be, but it's not to say that you can't have 
a more traditional job, like maybe being an account manager or a customer success job, um, also working online. I think the biggest thing here is finding companies that are 100% remote. That was my thing when I was targeting jobs. I was looking for companies that are 100% remote because in the interview, you obviously can't be like, okay, I wanna get this job and then I wanna go off and travel. Like no one's gonna be down with that. A lot of jobs say you need to like stay in the United States or like stay in your country. So like with my, experience i knew the company was 100 percent remote and they were never going to require us to go in office and then following that i just kind of started little by little and when my boss was like oh how's florida i was like oh i'm actually in peru you know and he was like oh that's so cool and then it slowly turned into i'm going to hawaii i'm going to croatia and like building it up but it's not to say that I haven't worked for companies and I do have friends that never tell their companies that they are traveling. So um, it can be done, but I think the biggest thing here is just finding a company that is 100% remote, not hybrid, not gonna have you go in the office or anything like that because I think that's where you're gonna see the backlash and there's different positions, but I think the top two are definitely marketing and technology. Okay. Interesting. Some employers, they have obviously the tax implications of um, having employees that travel around the world as well. So I think that that's one of their biggest concerns. But if you can find an employee that doesn't have that, then I think it's probably. And also, too, for any Americans listening to this, um, as an American, you can file for FEIE, which is like a tax exemption for essentially when you only spend 35 days in the United States. And when you file it for it, what you're doing is you're getting back all of your money in taxes besides your um, Social Security and like Medicare and your employer actually doesn't have to know about it. So like that's the thing is, for example, if you are a W-2 employee and you want to file for FEIE, you totally could. I did work for a company and they did not know that I was outside the U.S. at all. And I filed for FEIE with them. And so it was a way that I could make more money and not have to pay tax um, legally. Um, but yeah, that's yeah. there are little loopholes in the digital nomad space for um, trying to pay less tax, but also like not necessarily telling your employer. Yeah, nice. What are the main differences in being a remote employee versus having your own remote setup uh, and being self-employed? And is there one that you prefer over the other or are there advantages, disadvantages to one and one and the other so i i think the biggest thing the biggest difference is going to be the time zone implications so if you for example are a remote employee and you have to be on from nine to five eastern you're not going to have the freedom to go and travel to bali and australia or thailand or something like that as your own employee pending the way that you build your contracts you can make yourself not tied to a time zone. Now, for the first two and a half years of my digital nomad journey, I was working still for that tech company. We didn't have super strict hours, but I did need to be on during US hours. Um, I would say I needed to be checking everything till at least 3 p.m. Eastern time. And I was gradually knew that I wanted to build to totally not being tied to a time zone. So that's where I am now with all of my clients. I do not have certain hours. I write my contracts to where they're very deliverable based and that I can deliver them the content within that month. And now it's really allowed me to be more free. So I think that's the ideal scenario. But for me to get to a place where I'm doing this, I was freelancing part time for two years before this and then went full time freelancing, built my own agency. And now I'm totally doing my own thing. And I think really in the past year it started to work. And that's because of like word of mouth. Now I'm getting referral business. I don't have to go and look for clients. Clients are finding me. So with this, like it's not going to happen overnight. Um, obviously, the ideal is no time zone. That's really just going to open up so many more doors for you. And I think, too, avoiding meetings. Like if you have a bunch of meetings, you're also going to find that the digital nomad lifestyle is going to be a bit challenging. Um, just trying to compensate for those meetings, also hiding from the clients that it's night here and it's day there and they can see the window in the background. Um, so I think... Obviously, if you can work for yourself, but if you're working for a company, 
I'd look for the ones that are more flexible with the timing. And I always say in interviews, like the biggest thing for me is just flexibility. Um, and if in the description, it says like need to be on from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern, you can apply, but I wouldn't necessarily be targeting that type of job because yeah, you will become a nomad, but you are going to be extremely limited in your travel and how much you can really embrace this lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, if we take the nine to five Eastern time, I mean, so someone working in, you know, South or Central America as a digital nomad would be able to manage that, I think, fairly easily. Even in Europe, to be honest, like, I mean, if you're happy working in the afternoon to kind of late in the evening, you could probably make it work as well. It's when you get further east and into Asia where it, it probably becomes a problem. So I guess it depends really on what your travel preferences are, where you want to be and where you want to go in the world. And the other thing too with this is like, with this lifestyle, like you do have to work. I meet so many people and they're like, I just like wouldn't work. Like I would just be traveling the whole time, blah, blah, blah. And that's the thing is like when you realize that if you don't work and you don't maintain this job or maintain these clients that you're not going to be able to live this lifestyle, like you will work. Like I remember when I was living in Montenegro, like being on client calls at like 1 a.m. And like pushing through and then in Thailand, waking up, jumping on calls at like 5 a.m. So like you will um, do it because you realize that like, OK, this can go away um, so quickly. This is where I think the digital nomad community really comes into play because so many friends, so many of my friends are digital nomads. We would work together. We would do that stuff together. So I didn't feel alone. I found it was a lot harder if I went and stayed in like hostels or something and trying to work because the mindset was definitely party the whole time versus if you are in a co-living or with a crew of digital nomads, it's going to be a lot easier to be on that stricter schedule. Yeah. Surrounding yourself with the right people, essentially. Yes. Which I also think is like the super key to this lifestyle. I would not be where I am if I didn't have the connections that I have now. And I don't think that you have to come from some rich family or go to an amazing college to get these. It's really about putting yourself in a situation to meet these people. There's different paid digital nomad groups that you can join, which I highly recommend, but there's also like Facebook events and stuff. But once my network changed, that's when the doors opened and I started getting a lot of clients and people started recognizing who I was and my whole life just changed after that. Mm. So yeah, the power of a network is, is very important. Let's build a little bit on the um, you have to work aspect of the digital nomad. Yeah, because to, to keep, obviously, to make the money, like in the short term, obviously, you need to work. You need to put in the work and get your business. But how do you ensure longevity of your business? Like that this is a sustainable lifestyle that you're able to continue over years and maybe decades is a stretch, but you know, that you're able, that you're not thinking this is going to run out one day and what am I going to do when it happens? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is always planting multiple seeds at all times. Even in my freelance business, I'm not someone that like, I'm constantly looking for new clients. I build my contracts based on retainer. So I found that this one allows me to know how much money I'm coming in every single month. So I highly recommend doing this if you are getting into freelancing. Even if it's like, you're gonna take 10 hours for a client, be like, oh, okay, I'll offer you 12 hours and it's gonna be a set rate a month because that's gonna allow you to really have some stability with this. But the other thing too is like planting multiple seeds. So right now I don't need any more clients, but I'm always occasionally, I would say at least every two to three days applying for things on LinkedIn. Just quick, easy, always putting myself out there, always looking for the next opportunity. When you meet someone, being curious to actually getting to know them, not thinking like, oh, what can I get from this person? But be genuinely curious, get to know them because then who knows that can turn into another opportunity. I think it came out, it was like 90 or 80% of digital nomads own their own business. So once you start running in this inner circle, it's about really connecting with people. And then you're always going to be guaranteed to have clients and know people that can get you somewhere. For example, now I have multiple friends that own different businesses, but I also too can message them and 
if I lose one of my clients, like I have other people that I can lean into. And it's essentially, I like to think of it as like a non-tangible um, asset. And I think that's really important in this digital nomad lifestyle because like, yeah, you can have money and the more money you have, like that's gonna be, that's great. But the more connections that you can have, but also like ability to learn things, ability to put yourself in settings, that's gonna really ensure the longevity of this. The other thing too is like watching the way that you write your contracts. For example, in the United States, like even if you're working a W-2 job, you only have a two week notice. With my clients, they have to give me a month's notice. So I actually have more security now working as a freelancer than I did when I was working in the United States as a W-2. Um, so I think looking into that and then lastly, is um, doing a bit of offsetting. And what I mean by that is like, I wouldn't spend all of your time as a digital nomad in the most expensive place thinking that, oh, I can sustain this lifestyle no matter what. Because the truth is remote jobs are more and more competitive. Companies are going back to the office. They are trying to turn away from this remote lifestyle. So what I used to do is I'd spend my summers in Europe and then I'd spend my winters in Mexico or South America or Asia. So doing a little bit of both will allow you to do so much more with your money. And the actual average I was reading of a digital nomad salary is like 50,000 US. So it's not significantly higher than what the, I think that's like the average in the United States as well. So it's not a huge number. We have this idea that digital nomads are really rich and they're not really rich. It's just a matter of balancing the places that you're at and then also making your tax situation work for you. Yeah, I think, yeah, you say $50,000 is, is not a lot. De definitely by US standards, because I think that, that amount of money in Europe um, is, is actually quite a lot. Um, and it's above definitely the, the average salary in a lot of European countries. Um, and what someone can do with that in different parts of the world um, you know, varies greatly. Like fifty thousand dollars in the U.S. might not go very far, but fifty thousand dollars in Eastern Europe, like you might be living like a king or a queen almost. So the geo arbitrage part of uh, digital nomading as well, I think, is very. Um, it's an important part of the lifestyle that makes it work as well. Definitely. Yeah, and even to, um, and of course, fifty thousand U.S. is high compared to like European um, salary. But even even if you're only making. 30,000. There's still a lot that you can do with that, especially if you're traveling in South America, Mexico or Asia. Like I when I was living in Mexico, it's very easy to live off of like a thousand dollars a month, 700. And that's you going out all the time, eating out, living in a nice place. So I think really being able to tap into some of those countries that are more affordable, um, or even when I lived in Argentina, Argentina was really, really affordable. Your money is going to go so much farther. Yeah, yeah. Nice. That's maybe a good segue into the next question, which um, I'm going to expand a little bit beyond what we originally had. So how can someone who is a digital nomad secure US clients? And I'm going to add into this question and Europe, maybe European clients as well, because I think it's this, the same kind of principle. You know, there might be digital nomads from Europe uh, who are traveling and, and also European clients make up their business. So how can someone go about that whilst traveling the world? So I think the biggest thing is the way that you paint yourself to be portrayed. So. Think of LinkedIn as your digital real estate. When people look at your LinkedIn profile, they need to get the impression that you are very established. You know what you're doing. People need to really be able to look at your LinkedIn and get a strong view of who you are, what you can offer them. The other platform I recommend a lot is Upwork. This has been a gateway into me getting a lot of clients. This is essentially how I started my freelance business. Um, so I think painting yourself to be portrayed as someone of value on both of these platforms is going to help you a lot. And then when it comes to actually going out and reaching to people, it's making sure that you have examples of whatever you're offering and that you have quite a bit of them. And if, for example, you want US clients, but you don't have any clients actually in that space, it's creating something so that they can see it. In my case, my travel blog 
was my example. I didn't have any clients I was writing for. So when I submitted myself to jobs, I was sending different blogs that I wrote from my own example. So making sure that you have an example. And the biggest thing I think with the US market is showing additional value. When I would reach out to companies, because I was doing SEO writing at first, I would always pull like a quick audit on their website and be like, hey, by the way, you're only ranking for X, X, and X you aren't doing anything with all of these um, and then telling them what I can offer them. So it's really about positioning yourself with that upper hand and them seeing the value right from the start. I do have on my LinkedIn and on my Upwork that I am located in the United States. So I do think if you are targeting US clients, if you don't have a US bank account, this is where this is going to become a little bit of an issue. Um, and so I wouldn't necessarily put it in US, but I would maybe put it in UK or somewhere in Europe um, so that people are more open. I found in the US they are more open to people generally from the UK. My friends that are from the UK that have you, I have a lot of friends that are from the UK but have US clients. Um, so if you are in Europe, maybe putting your location as the UK, um, but keeping your location as one of the things that will help you a lot. If you're traveling or living abroad and you need to use a different currency from your home currency, then check this out. I've been using a multi-currency platform called Wise for many years now, and it's a great solution for people who are looking to send money abroad, convert money, and spend money in foreign currencies. Wise offers competitive exchange rates with low commissions, meaning that when you need to exchange money to another currency, you don't overpay to do so. You can get bank details for a range of different currencies to be able to send and receive money abroad. You also receive a virtual debit card so that you can make purchases in other currencies, which is particularly useful when you're traveling. And you also have the option to get a physical debit card if you wish as well. This is an absolute must have for me when I travel. I've been to multiple different countries around the world with my Wise card and I'm very happy to have done so. It also helps me on a daily basis when it comes to banking in multiple different countries. Sign up to Wise today using the link in the video description on YouTube or in the show notes on podcasting platforms. And now let's get back to the podcast. And then not necessarily when you speak with them, being directly honest until the deal is signed, you guys are personal, you know about their children, like they ask where you are, like, I mean, I told people I'm in Florida. Yeah, I'm living here, blah, blah, blah. And then eventually, oh, I also have a residency in Spain and kind of telling it okay. slowly. But it also, it comes down to, to the type of people that you're trying to get. But if you're targeting just general businesses, I found that in the US they are open um, as long as like you are consistently delivering that value straight up from the beginning and when they look you up, you've got a page that shines, people know what you do um, and it's really easy to see that. Also, like a small tip here is like having a lot of LinkedIn connections I think also makes you look better at them seeing that you have more than 500, that's going to help to up level it as well. Yeah. It's funny, I was going to say, when you gave like the sector breakdown, I think it started to make a bit more sense. But because I was thinking like, while you speak, I was like, is it really that taboo? Like that I tell someone that I'm, you know, originally from here, but living somewhere else. Like I was. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't want to endorse lying, but I also think too, like it is going to give you an upper hand. Like I, for example, with one of the jobs where they didn't know that I was traveling, if I would have told them, I don't think I ever would have got that job. So it's really feeling out the vibe. Um, another way that you can do this, like not as obvious is like in your email signature, having your location too. Um, and so that they get an idea of like, oh, she's in blah, 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 or she's from there. Um, this was more important when I first started. Now all my clients, they know I'm in Spain. Um, I've been talking with this new client and like on the first interview, I like told them like, oh, I have a place in US, but I have a residency in Spain. So now that I have some years of experience, it's made it easier. Um, but people are definitely hesitant, especially if you just started traveling. That's something else that I constantly bring up with my clients is like, I've been living this lifestyle for four years. I've been operating like this for a long time. So if you are first starting out, Maybe not necessarily saying like, oh yeah, I've only been traveling for the past three months and now I want you to work with me. 
you want them to have this idea that you really know what you're doing and that no matter what, you're going to follow through. Yeah. Yeah. Your channel on YouTube is uh, still growing at, at the moment, but you, do you think, how do you think you'll deal with this scenario if someone has seen you on YouTube and that ends up being your client? I mean, to, no, to be honest, if that scenario comes up and they're contacting you, then they already know and they're cool with it, I guess. Yeah. I and the thing with this is this is when it comes down to like the kind of connections you've built, because now the only type of clients that I attract, they're like, I want to work with you no matter what. What are your rates? What can you offer me? So that's the thing is like, once you start doing good work and it does take some time, really, I didn't see this word of mouth referral come in until about a year, year and a half ago. But then you're going to be in a position where now they don't care where I am. They don't care what they pay. They, they want to work with me no matter what. So that's the thing is like, it does take time to build up. And I think too, with the freelancing, like I, when I first started, I accepted anything I could get. I was super, super under, like, I remember I would write one blog post, do the SEO, upload it into WordPress for like 20 bucks. And it would take me like five or six hours. And so I did start really low, but all of that built up my experience. I got to learn a lot. And then I was able to now be in the position to where like, I, if you want to, you need to work on a certain time zone or you want me to do a certain thing for you, I won't work for you, period. So but yeah. it takes time to get to that point. But it is possible exactly. with courses. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you got you got yourself to a point where you can decide for yourself now um, at the start, yeah. that That's where the competition comes in, isn't it? Yeah, you got to try and make yourself competitive somehow. But now because you're established, you can choose your clients, you can choose your rates, you can say, I'm going to do this, I'm not going to do this. Yeah, and I think the thing is too here is like, recognizing that like this is going to take time and that it is a journey and it's going to take time to build this and constantly investing into whatever you're trying to build whether it's a freelancing business or you're trying to f get a job with that perfect company but consistently invest investing in it i'm consistently still looking for new clients even though i right now i don't have the capacity but i'm like okay i'll hire out whatever I need to do. I'm consistently still taking yeah. courses, watching YouTube videos, doing things, even though I know I'm getting to more senior level of where I am with what I'm doing in marketing. So it's that consistent investment in yourself that's gonna take you so much further with this and it's gonna take time. Okay, very nice. I think on a like not related to money front, I do think the digital nomad lifestyle is not for everyone. Um, and no matter okay. how you see it portrayed online, there is definitely cons. Um, so I essentially spent three and a half years full time on the road. I did around 30 countries, 200 cities in that time. And by that, by the end of that, I was burned out. I was tired of moving around. I was tired of having like friends in one place, but not having like a crew of people and constantly being alone. That's the other thing. Digital nomad lifestyle is extremely lonely um, and you have to be really comfortable with being alone by yourself constantly. The other thing that was making it really hard is having a relationship. Now, some people get really lucky. They meet another digital nomad and it works for them. But I wouldn't say that's the majority. I would say that's maybe 20%. Um, and so I really also, I wanted to have a relationship. I had been single for like three and a half years. And I knew that if I kept up this lifestyle, that it was going to be hard to find someone just because I was constantly meeting people. And it was very transient. That's the thing with the digital nomad lifestyle. Like you meet people, you guys have an amazing connection, whether friendship, romantic, whatever it may be. And then they go off to their life and you go back to yours. And it's just this open door that's constantly going. And if you're someone that you really like to have like a good crew with you all the time, or you really need the support of others, um, and you don't necessarily like to be alone in a random city, um, not knowing the language, that type of thing, doing this full time is not going to probably be the best option for you. And I do think 
you should try it. I think everyone should try being a digital nomad and see if they like it, but also accepting yourself and being like, okay, if I don't like this, that's okay. Because it does take a very strong type of personality and someone that not only is like emotionally strong, but also like street smart too, because depending where you're going, once you land in that country, like doesn't matter where your parents are or whatever happens, like you're going to have to figure it out. I remember like living in Mexico and like being robbed by the police and like being in Argentina and having problems. And it's like, you got to think quick. And so that's the thing too, is like, if you're someone where like, you're not, that's not your area. This is not going to be the right lifestyle for you because things are going to get uncomfortable and will consistently get uncomfortable, which is a pro and a con. Um, but it's not a walk in the park and it's definitely not what Instagram paints it to be. Um, and I think the biggest thing is, is the loneliness um, and dealing with like, wow, I, I wish I had someone here. I know no one here. No one speaks my language. And yeah, some days it was hard. Yeah, I can imagine. I can definitely imagine. It's important, yeah, for people to keep that in mind as well. And I don't know if I wouldn't say I would never go back to full-time nomading. The, the thing is that's really weird now is because I did do it for so long, I like stimulated my mind so that when I first started living in Valencia, I actually was like struggling a lot because I was like, I need to move around. Like I need to go somewhere else. Like I was finding these like desires. I was like, I need to do something like, and I was, I was struggling. Whereas now it's calm down and I do miss elements of my nomad lifestyle and I would like to go back to it in some capacity but I think that for me I'm always going to have a base now I did go two and a half years with no apartment no nothing literally just my backpack which was really fun but like also it sucked because <laughs> sometimes you're like okay I need to go somewhere for like two weeks I don't want to go anywhere I wish I had like a house and I could just like go relax <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now that's why I'm happy I'm in Valencia. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Perfect. And with that, we'll move on to the next part of the the discussion, which is more around your travel and your experiences. So obviously you're in Spain now, which we'll come back to uh, once we've covered the first part. Someone who is trying to choose where to go as a digital nomad, how would they make that decision? Or how would you suggest that they decide where is right for them to go? I think the biggest thing is what type of lifestyle are you envisioning? Are you envisioning something that's really like calm, chill, minimalist, like you don't need to wear shoes, swimsuit type of vibe? If that's what you're envisioning, then like pop over to Mexico. If you're envisioning working in really cool, like techie cafes, having everything you need, living in a luxury apartment, Bangkok is probably a better place for you. So it's really recognizing and thinking about like what type of lifestyle do you want to have? How do you want to be doing things on a daily basis? Do you want to have to take a car? Is it important for you to be able to walk everywhere? Are you going to have to take taxis? Um, I think this is, especially when I think about traveling through South America, like taking different taxis and stuff sometimes can be a bit of a challenge. So it's recognizing too, like, what level of challenge do you want to deal with? Do you want to go somewhere where you don't really need to worry about having your phone out and carrying your laptop? Or are you cool with like not bringing your laptop anywhere and actually having a burner phone? Like, are you cool with that? Because if you are, then maybe you should go to Brazil. So it's recognizing like what is going to be that level of comfort for you. I always recommend people, if you're first starting out and you're coming from the US, go to Europe. Um, that's going to be a way easier adjustment. Um, and then if you're liking Europe and you want to do something a little bit more different and you want to get more chill, take a little bit more risks, I would go to Mexico. And then when you're feeling like, okay, I'm ready, I can get uncomfortable, I don't need my phone to walk down the street, I know where I'm going, I can pick up on a language, I can pick up on when things are happening, that's when I would head to South America. Um, and then when it comes to Asia, I didn't necessarily, I don't think it's as dangerous or you need to be on the high alert as South America. The big, I, I mean, you don't need to be on as high alert in Asia as you do in South America, but the biggest difference is the culture. So when you are really comfortable with being alone and really comfortable with not meeting other nomads too, because I remember when I was in Bangkok, for example, 
it was really hard to meet people. I went to like one meetup and met like seven people. But besides that, you are like on your own. So thank God I was with the friends because I felt really like outside of their culture. And it wasn't like I was uncomfortable to bring my things with me. I wasn't nervous of anything of that, but just like royally uncomfortable, just like walking out of my apartment. And it's just a totally different environment. You've got scooters, you turn one street, it's like you're in one place, then there's a skyscraper. So it, it just varies a lot. So it's asking yourself like, what do I wanna do? And I always recommend, like I said, gradually building. But if you're like me, I just like went to the hardest places. I wanted to travel Mexico by myself. I wanted to travel South America by myself um, just because I built that up. So it's also listening to your intuition. Throughout 2020, I did intuitive traveling. That's what I call it, where essentially I would meditate and wherever came up, that's where I would go. And I would also allow it to change. So for example, I remember me and my friend were gonna go to Colombia and we had like gotten our tickets and everything. And I woke up, I had this intuitive feeling and I was like, Colombia is gonna go into lockdown. And she was like, well, I'm still going. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna stay here in Mexico. And she went and two days later, Colombia went into lockdown. So by also tapping into your intuition and hearing the places you're called to, that's gonna lead you to the next best thing. Something that I noticed with nomading is like, if you try to plan it out too much, you can't actually like flow with it. So a lot of times I would just like go somewhere and maybe book my accommodation for like two weeks, see what I wanna do. Because you don't wanna feel like, oh, now I have to go here, but I'm like actually really loving it here. Um, so allowing yourself to flow with it and listen to whatever is deep inside. Okay, nice. Yeah, because I'm a very rigorous plan things out, have my whole day scheduled in Google Calendar. And then probably, yeah, I would be thinking what's next after these two weeks, but leaving a bit of spontaneity then it, uh, it adds to the sense of adventure. Yeah, and like I was doing the same when I first started nomading. And then what I realized is like, I remember I was in, um, I was in Playa de Carmen and I had met some people and they were, I was like really vibing with them and I was like, okay, cool, like let's keep hanging out. And I was like, oh no, like I have to go to Tulum and I've already paid for accommodation. And so like I ended up like losing money on that accommodation because I wanted to hang out with those people. So that's where the spontaneity comes in and it's like nice to have it. Now, bear in mind, if you are a digital nomad and you're trying to do summer in Europe, do not do this. Okay, like, don't do this. Europe is busy. Yeah. There is no accommodation. Like, don't do this. But if you are traveling, not summer in Europe, you can pretty much do this. Yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah, yeah. Like, Europe right now is just full of tourists. It's high tourist <laughs> yeah. season right now. And the accommodations, like, the prices go up. It's higher. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's where I think if you are going to somewhere that's, like, super super desirable for example i went to kofan yang for the full moon party i booked that accommodation for the party like four months in advance and it was only like three days but it's also recognizing too like is there going to be a festival there is there something going on there and keeping your keeping that in mind with your plans as well okay nice of all the destinations you visited um where are your top picks like where are your, the favorite place your favorite places that you've so been number to one is probably croatia i love croatia i i love the sea i've also i love the city in zagreb so i've traveled the north of croatia all the way down to the south there is just this super calming energy right when you arrive majority of people speak english you don't need to worry about anything. I lived there for about nine months. I never ran into any type of issue with anything. Um, so I think Croatia is great. Also, their government is so welcoming to digital nomads. I was there around Christmas time and they had a weekend for nomads. It was all, all of the stuff was free. We did like a paint and wine night. The next day they picked us up in a private charter bus. They took us to a castle. They fed us a five course meal and then they took us back to Zagreb. It was all free. Um, so they're really welcoming to nomads. They also have a really attractive digital nomad visa that is tax free um, for money that you're not making in Croatia. Um, so love Croatia. I think that's a great one. Um, the other one, obviously, I think Spain is great. It's 
the difference between Spain and Croatia is Spain is super multicultural. So that's the only disadvantage of Croatia is like in the summer, there is a lot of tourists. But besides that, 90% of people living in Croatia are Croatian. So if you value multiculture, you want to be around a diverse group of people, multiple languages, Spain is a really good place um, to be. The other one is Thailand. I honestly think if you're a digital nomad with no time zone ties at all, Thailand is the best place to be. There is an amazing sense of like community and stuff there, especially if you go in the islands. It's a little bit harder in like Bangkok, but if you're in the islands or Chiang Mai, Thailand has a lot to offer, a lot of cafes, very affordable um, and just really great quality of life. I loved the Thai people. They're so pleasant to be around. Um, so I love Thailand. And then last but not least, and this isn't, I think it could be good for digital nomads, but I also, for me, it's the other place that I would love to live, like actually live permanently, and that's Australia. I think of Australia as like the US, but more affordable and more safe. So if you're someone that you like the US lifestyle, but you're overpaying the prices and you don't like that it's not super safe, check out Australia because they've got a really good vibe down under, down there, so. Okay, nice. I'm going to ask you this because it's a very common one for entrepreneurs and solopreneurs, but I haven't heard you mention it. Dubai, have you been or do you um, have any thoughts? I about personally it? Haven't, haven't been. The only hesitation I would have towards Dubai is as a small blonde female, this does change the landscape a little bit for me um, traveling, obviously. And in Dubai, there are certain parts where you need to have a man with you. There's different things. So I try to stay away from places that are going to be a little bit more strict, maybe with what females can do. For example, like I had a friend go to Malaysia and like, I didn't want to go to Malaysia because she had to like cover up the whole time. And like there were certain parts of Malaysia she couldn't go to without a man. And so I think this is what comes down to like your preferences. If you're female and like you're cool with like adapting to those rules, you don't mind like if you need to wear a certain thing or if in certain spots you need to have a guy with you or do something like that and you're cool with that, then great. But if you're like me and you're like Florida blood, like, I'm sorry, but no, so <laughs> I'm not doing that. Um, but I would, I would love to okay. check enough. out Dubai um, eventually with a guy. Good, cool, fair enough. Now let's come back to Spain and specifically Valencia. So, of all of these countries, you chose Valencia. Why? So, the biggest thing is like it's a city on the coast. So I love spending my winters in Mexico and living in really small beach towns and just like the simplicity of the beach lifestyle. And I also loved like living in cities. So like going and living in Zagreb or living in Prague or something like that. And I found that Valencia was like the perfect mix because you have a decent sized city. The population is around 800,000. So it's not gonna be super big. It's not as big as Madrid but you are gonna have decent sized city. You're not gonna be able to like walk it in like 10 minutes or anything like that. But within a 15 minute bike ride from where I live, I can be at the beach. And then if I go an hour with the car in any direction or even 30 minutes, you have beautiful beaches in Alicante, you can be in the Pyrenees mountains in four and a half hours. So it, I realized that I could have a mix of everything I want without having to travel to all these different spots. The other thing is definitely the weather. Right now, it is unbearably hot because it's July and August. But besides these two months, the weather is really good. Even in like February, January time, it's still in the 50s and 60s. So like 15, 17 degrees Celsius. So it's still really nice to be around. So the weather. And then lastly, I would say coming from the U.S., affordability. It's significantly less for me to live here than it what it cost me to live in Florida when I was living there. So that was the biggest thing as I realized like, wow, I can work less and do so much more. A big part of my journey this past year is I went full on into my creative endeavors. Like I got rid of some clients and I was like, I'm going to focus on Instagram, YouTube, and I want to see where this gets me. And I was only able to do that because I was living in Valencia and it was more affordable than full-time traveling because the short-term housing does get expensive. 
um, especially if you're moving a lot. Um, so I was able to get an apartment here for affordable, um, affordability, an affordable way, and the just the overall um, city as well. Lastly, it is very safe. I don't know anyone who's had any type of problem here, like gotten their phone stolen, had any type of issue. It doesn't seem like it has the same types of issues that Barcelona has. Um, and people are really open to tourists. Like I haven't experienced anyone being rude to me because my Spanish isn't good enough or anything like that. So I felt really welcomed um, by the Valencian community from the beginning. Yeah, I was going to ask you about uh, yeah why you choose Valencia over Barcelona, but basically the, the the reasons you've given there are like the same reasons that I would also choose Valencia over Barcelona. Valencia, I see it as like it has all the good things of Barcelona without the busyness, um, without the stress, and, and and it's more affordable as yeah, well. Yeah, the as advantage said. I would say that Barcelona has over Valencia is there is a bigger digital nomad community, drastically bigger. I've noticed it change a lot in Valencia in the past year. When I first came here last summer, it was hard. Um, I really struggled to meet my people. I was even hosting a lot of events, doing different things, and I really struggled. And now it's changed so much. There's so much going on for expats, English speakers, that it's crazy. And like I've also had like six friends move here in the past four months that I've met out traveling. So like... Valencia, I think, is like gonna pop off. The good thing about Valencia, though, is like they do have a lot of legislation in place around like restaurants they can open, things that they can build. So it does ensure, as long as that legislation doesn't change, that it won't become Barcelona. Because, like, for example, now in Rusafa, you can't open a restaurant unless you already have the license and you have to get the license from someone who had a license. So there's things in place that I'm hoping will keep it still more calm, but we are seeing an influx in price and an influx in people moving here. And most of them are expats. Okay, that's interesting. And so you moved to Spain on a digital nomad yes. visa, right? So I think you're actually the first person that I've talked with um, who has come to Spain on a digital nomad visa. So I'd be very interested to hear how was your experience? Like yeah. what was the process uh, like? So I was like one of the first people to apply for the visa. So essentially the visa came out last year at like end of February, that's when they started saying it was out. And I immediately came to Spain in March. Now, when I first came, it was a problem because there was no real clear path to what you needed to submit. So I was hearing like different things, like on the US Embassy website, it was saying one thing, my lawyer was saying another thing. And so it was really inconsistent. Um, and I ended up finally submitting for the visa at end of June. Now, they say like, okay, after 20 days, if you don't hear anything, um, you can apply for a silent approval. Well, the thing is, is for some reason, my application got lost with like 20 other applications. So like when I applied, I didn't hear anything for the 20 days. So we went for the silent approval and my lawyer applied for that. Well, after that, you can't do anything. You just have to wait for them to like actually approve the silent approval. And that took about two months. And there was about 20 of us who had applied at the same time I did. It was like the last three days of June. And we just never heard anything about our applications. The only reason I know there was 20 of us is because of the Facebook groups. Um, and then finally I got the approval, but getting approved is like literally step one in this process. The next thing that needs to happen is you need to get a TIE appointment. And in Valencia, they were super, super backed up. At one point, I actually hired a hacker to get me an appointment because my lawyer could not get me an appointment. And you're supposed to have an appointment within a month of getting your approval. I couldn't get my appointment till end of November. So I applied at the end of June. Wow. I didn't get a yes until August. I couldn't get an appointment till the end of November. So what's weird about this visa though is in that time frame of waiting for your approval and actually your tie they can reverse your application and deny you so at any point they can just say you know what actually we're not going to give you it um so i was really worried and nervous about this and then when you go for the tie appointment they can also deny you 
there as well and i went with my boyfriend and his spanish is like perfect and fluent and i would recommend if your spanish isn't good when you go for the tie appointment having someone that speaks spanish with you because they weren't super kind when i was there um they were like where was your visa to come into madrid and i was like well i'm american i didn't need a visa and they were like yeah you did they were really trying to not give it to me so I don't think this is going to be consistent across the board. And that's what I've noticed with this visa. Like I've had friends who've gotten it, gotten their TIE in a month and a half. I've had friends, like I had a friend from the UK who literally randomly got denied and she can't get the visa. So their approval process is super inconsistent. I think the biggest thing here though, is they are looking for money. And in addition to my application, a non like formal requirement that I submitted, I showed them about 25,000 US dollars in the bank. And I don't think that's the only reason I got approved, but if you can show them some money in the bank, that's going to make a difference. And that's the only thing that I can pull from all these people who've been approved who've not, because it's not a formal requirement. But if you've shown some money, I don't know anyone who's shown some money and not gotten it. There are many viewers of my channel who are looking for the way to make their dream of moving to and living in Spain a reality. And two of the most common questions I get asked in the comments are, Johnny, how can I move to Spain and which visa do I need? My Friends of Bureaucracy are an expert team with specialist knowledge on immigration procedures and different visa options when it comes to moving to Spain. And they'll be more than happy to help you with your visa application. Whether you're looking to come to Spain on a non-lucrative visa, whether that's as a retiree or or whether you're just taking some time off and want to enjoy the country, whether you're a digital nomad coming from outside of the European Union and you think Spain is the right place for you, or maybe you're trying to take advantage of the golden visa option whilst it's still available. Bureaucracy can make your life easier by telling you what documents you need, helping you to translate those documents, bring everything together, and they'll also give you a visual dashboard in your client area where you can see how your application is progressing along. So if you need support with your Spanish visa application, then head over to bureaucracy.es forward slash millennials with money all together. You'll get a free initial consultation with the team. And then if you decide to go ahead with the process, you'll get 10% off the cost. Thanks to you being a follower of this podcast. That's bureaucracy.es forward slash millennials with money all together. You can find the link in the video description on YouTube and in the show notes on the podcasting platforms. Now let's get back to the episode. Yeah. I mean, it's um, it's one of the things that they want in digital nomads, like is that they're not going to become a burden on the state. So it definitely makes sense what you say as well. Um, I'm going to take um, advantage here and share a tip that I have um, for getting appointments um, in the administration. So depending on where it is, each kind of extranjería department has a certain time and day of the week that they publish those appointments so once you find that out be online at that time and be hit and refresh in the browser immediately and if you can't get a, an appointment what i always did fortunately it never got to that for me i never got past like 30 days for like renewing a card or anything but take screenshots with a date and timestamp that there are no appointments available so that if you need to appeal one day then you have the proof that look, I'm trying, but I can't get one because your system doesn't have appointments. It, no guarantee that it will work, but it's a backup that I always had ready just in case I had to pull it out of the yeah. bag. And that's, I did that. That's what me and my lawyer did exactly um, to have that support. The yeah. thing with the visa though, and I think this is really important for people to hear is like, there is, if you are filing as autonomo, which as an American, you have to be autonomo because of the social security deal in the United States. You cannot go for Beckham's law and there is no tax break. There is so much bad information out there about how you can save money on taxes. And like, none of that is true. And there is no tax breaks. Doesn't matter if you have a holding company in Estonia, whatever it may be. If you are coming to Spain on this digital nomad visa, you have to pay tax on your global income and it is the progressive rate. And they are looking for people who aren't paying taxes. I recently was reading that they're going back through old applications and making sure that those people have been paying their quarterly taxes and are paying social security. And if they look and you haven't, they are revoking people's visas. I really think with this visa, since they're already seeing that backlash, this visa has barely been out a year, like it will be a year in February. They're already seeing like that backlash. 
I think that like you're going to see Spain limit the amount of visas or potentially get rid of this visa. So that's the thing. If you are interested in this, you need to go for it soon um, because the fact that they're going back through the old applications and stuff and everything that's going on in Barcelona with the Airbnbs, I wouldn't be surprised if they limited it or in a few years got rid of it. Yeah, I would be I wouldn't go as far as to say I think they'll get rid of it. I think what they might do is as you say like increase the requirements, maybe increase the income requirements, limit the the group of people who are eligible to apply. Um but I think it's it's such a new thing. So I think for them to make a U-turn on it, um I think it would surprise me I hope if they not, were to do that. Cuz this is my only um, way to live here. Yeah. <laughs> so I really I yeah, hope yeah, not. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, there's other visa options, but I think, yeah, if you're someone who works, then digital nomad visa and you're a non-EU citizen, of course, then yeah, digital nomad visa is probably the the way to go. One other thing I was going to say, yeah, then the administration as well in like the appointments, um, I think it very much depends on like the luck of the draw who you get that day. Um, I've generally, I've never had a particularly negative experience. Um, I've had the odd person who is like a little bit more friendly than the others. In Madrid, in Madrid, at least, I think everyone's kind of been the, the, like, you know, not necessarily thrilled to help me or kind of thing. But no one's been like overtly, um, yeah. you know, negative towards me in the, in the appointments. And I've had some people who are like, be, because I'm speaking, because I can't speak Spanish. I think that that also helps me as well, um, being able to communicate them. So they're a bit more, you know, relaxed and, and yeah and, level and that i think that makes sense where i went i went to a small town in valencia so you have to have your appointment wherever the county you're in so i also think that makes a difference too so if you can communicate in spanish you're going to be in a lot better spot in my case my boyfriend was like translating everything and i was like sitting there like a dog like, uh, what do, what's going on? <laughs> so for me, it was a little different, but like, no, nevertheless though, like it's, you can get this visa just if you have the money, it's going to be yeah. significantly easier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's important what you said about the Beckham law. Like, um, it, um, yeah. I mean, it is possible, like some people can get it, but it's like very, very specific cases and very specific profiles that can get it. So definitely someone who is interested in getting that should speak to a tax professional because they'll be able to clarify if it's if it's applicable in their situation. Because, I mean, may on, on another video where I spoke with a, a lawyer um, about the digital nomad visa, I, I brought this up and her kind of answer to it was that, you know, it's maybe a little bit of marketing the fact that they they advertised it along with the digital yeah. nomad visa yeah. and maybe they will there yeah. was rumors that they were going to change the law so that more people could get it i guess we'll stay tuned the only thing is though is like if you are living in spain and you're capitalizing on the benefits of living here paying the same taxes as everyone else makes sense in my mind um, so I can see why Spain is keeping it the way they are. Yeah. Yeah. So tips for making friends in Spain when you don't speak Spanish. I think the biggest thing is going to meetups. And if there aren't meetups going on, going on Facebook groups and actually putting time in to introducing yourself. So what I did is I would post a photo of me, but I'd also like post a photo of like my cat or dog, something that I knew would go a little bit more viral and posting and like trying to reach out and putting time into it. The other thing is like putting yourself in situations where you're gonna meet people. So I go to a Pilates class now up until like a few days ago i've been going for like three months everyone in the class only speaks spanish my spanish is still very beginner but i finally now have made a friend in that class so putting yourself in that situation where even if it's uncomfortable like going out there and doing things that you know that you like um so whether it's yoga pilates whatever it is but feeling like okay i can go out and do it and you will find that people are going to be able to speak some kind of english or whatever language you can speak whether it be french italian whatever it may be they're going to be able to speak some of it and you will be able to communicate so i think the biggest thing here is 
getting out there, not being afraid, and then investing your own time into hosting events or trying to meet people. The Facebook groups are like the biggest help with this um, and have been how I've met so many people. Um, and so I think Facebook lean into that as much as you can. Yeah, uh, they're good tips. And, and are there any other challenges that you faced as an American uh, moving to Spain and I adapting to life in Spain? It was really hard for me to get used to like the full on slow pace of life. Even though I'd come to Valencia for three years for like two months, I, throughout the three years of me full-time traveling, I was with expats and nomads. So like, we were all on this like fast paced life. Like what's next? Where are we going? What excursion are we doing? Where are we staying? Like, and when I came here, especially moving in with my Italian boyfriend, we were like very opposite. Like I was super fast paced. I didn't understand why everything was closed all the time. I also just like being from the US, I'm a bit of like a workaholic. My boyfriend was like, you need to stop talking about money. You need to stop like working so much. You need to relax. So this was hard to adjust to, especially the things being closed. Like I wasn't used to like, oh wow. Okay. It's like two to four. Everything is closed. Like what's up with this? But now I actually really like it. So I think the biggest thing that Spain has taught me is like patience. I can go into a restaurant now, no server can come up to me for like 25 minutes and I'm like mad chill. I'm like cool with it. So really adjusting to like the slower pace I think has been a little bit hard, but really worth it. And now something that I really love. And yesterday I had a siesta, maybe today I'll have one. So I'm all about embracing it now. <laughs> Nice. Starting to show some integration. Yes. And Spanish I eat dinner life. much later. So that was the other thing, like how late everything happens <laughs> here. Like it's crazy. Um, but now I like do everything a little yeah. bit later. So, yeah. Ah, cool. Okay. And then we had a question as well about the cost of living in Valencia. So how, how is the cost of so living in Valencia? For me personally, I found that I can live off of around 1800 to 2000 US dollars a month. So very similar to in euros. And I found that that amount allows me to go out a few times a week, um, go to the nail salon, get my hair done, maybe do 200 bucks, $300 worth of shopping that month. So I found that that's a very manageable amount. Now, bear in mind what's going to it's going to come down to here is your apartment and the cost of living. If you are in a really trendy area, for example, I live in Rusafa, most of the individual apartments here, they are I would say two to three bedrooms are like 1600 euros a month. When I got my apartment, that average was 1200. So I've been here for a little over a year. The rent is going up a lot in Valencia. And if you're on the expat groups, you're going to see people talking about this. Now, if you're willing to live outside of Rusafa, a little further away from the center, you can still find a more affordable apartment. Also, if you rent a room, you can still find a room for, I would say, four to 600 euros a month. Um, but find those days of like finding your own apartment for like seven or 800 unless you're by the beach or in a less desirable area, those are fading away, which is unfortunate. Luckily, I'm in this apartment in Rusafa. It's 800 a month. It's three bedrooms. I'm not giving it up for the life of me, but because <laughs> I've got it on lockdown. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's where you're going to see the difference. I think it's really easy to spend like 250, 200 on groceries a month. And then whatever your rent is and then use the rest. Like there's still a lot of food in Valencia where you can go out for a full lunch for like 10 euros. They have the mozzarella here, which is like six euros, toasted with tomatoes, like three euros. So it is really affordable, but the rent is where you're gonna see the price. And if you are considering moving here, finding an apartment with a foreign contract can be really challenging um, just because of the insurance situation. So this was something that me and my boyfriend struggled with. Um, and once we came across, like our landlord is German, we were able to get the apartment and it was fine. But if you do have a foreign contract, you can expect to have some hurdles to jump through just because they are less open to foreign contracts and people renting with them. Yeah. 
Cool. So I'm moving abroad soon. I'm looking for a place to live, but it's very difficult because I'm a foreigner. I don't understand the local language and there's a whole load of paperwork and local requirements that I have to fulfill. What can I do to find a place to live? Enter UniPlaces, the largest global platform for furnished rentals. On UniPlaces, you can find adverts from landlords who are advertising rooms and full apartments across Europe, the Americas and Oceania, and not have to worry about the bureaucracy, the guarantors, and all the paperwork that comes with doing processes locally. By booking through UniPlaces as well, you can also get a certificate of prepaid accommodation if that's required for your visa application. Once you make a booking request on the site, you can expect a response within 48 hours from the the landlord and once it's approved the place is yours and it doesn't end there because UniPlace's multilingual support team will stay with you right up until you move in even making sure that the move in was smooth and that the place fits the description that was on the website book now with the code ua millennials 25 and receive a 25 percent discount off UniPlace's service fee that's u for uniform a for alpha millennials with two l's and two n's two five you can find the code as well in the video description on YouTube and in the show notes on the podcast platforms. And now back to the episode. All right, Mikkel, this was a great conversation. I learned so much. So thank you so much for your time. As I do with every guest on the podcast, we're going to finish on a fun question. So Mikkel, your fun question is about yoga because I believe you are a yoga instructor as well as you know, the business activities that you do on the side. So I wanted to ask you, are there any principles from yoga that everyone can and should apply to everyday life? I think the biggest life? one is presence. I think so much of the digital age has given us this idea that if we're waiting in line for a coffee or waiting to cross the street, that we need to like be on our phone, we need to be looking at something, we need to be stimulated. And I think it's really important to spend time doing nothing. So while you're waiting for that coffee, not being on your phone when you're walking in the street, just being present walking, not listening to anything. So I think when you can infuse more presence into your life, you're going to get a lot more clarity. You're gonna get random bits of information, but you're also just gonna feel a bit more calm in general. So I think presence is huge. Um, and then the last one I would say is openness. And I think it's just being open to all different types of people, um, especially as I've been traveling. Um, we all know there's a lot of different wars. There's different things going on. And you're meeting people from a diverse group of countries. And being able to go into a situation and not judging someone based on where they're from or what you've heard about their country or what you've heard about their government or anything like that. So really applying that openness to your life, it's going to allow you to make more friends um, and it's allow you just to see people as people because that's truly all they are. Yeah. Amazing. Great tips. So Mikhail, thank you so much for this. It was Yay, a great Yay, awesome. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed that episode, guys. I'll leave the links to Michelle's blog and YouTube channel in the YouTube video description and on the show notes on the podcast platforms. Remember, if you'd like to support the podcast and the work that Millennials of Money does, then you can do so by signing up as a channel member on YouTube or by becoming a Patreon. And in return, you'll get some exclusive benefits as a thank you. Till next time, I'll see you on the next one. And let's get this money. <laughs>